It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 188 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 24th of May 2015. I'm Ed Brown and on the panel today is Dr Shane Joseph. G'day. Penny Dumsday. Hello. And the owner of Brisbane's Aquariums to Go and expert on all things fishy, Phil Kent. Welcome back to the show. Ahoy hoy. Ahoy hoy, really? Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, since you're a fishy guy, Phil, we might as well start talking of... Uh, the opar or moonfish it's a Mm -hmm. big deep water fish that ed yong describes as a big startled frisbee with thin red fins stuck on as an afterthought but it's special in its own way it's the only warm-blooded fish that we know of is that correct that is correct this is a a hot story in the fishy world um most fish (laughs) indeed Uh, most fish are thought of as cold-blooded so endothermic basically they're the same temperature as the water around them um it's been known that some fish have regional endothermy like tuna and sharks can actually warm their swing muscles so they can get a burst of speed um but these guys they live in the deep cool waters and normally that means they're slow moving the fish in the the deep and the cold don't tend to, to move too fast so what they've found when they had a look at the the gills of these things is they're using something called, or they have something called a retia mirabilia, which is normally found in um, situations where you're trying to recover heat, um, such as in those tuna and sharks, but it's normally in the muscle section, but they found it in the gills. Um, So what they found is they're actually recovering the heat before it would be lost to the environment through the gills. Um, so these guys are staying about five degrees warmer than the surrounding water, which is a, a huge deal when you're living in that, that very, very cold environment. Um, so that means that they can put on a very fast burst of speed um, and get a really good competitive advantage. Right. So these are these retia mirabilia, as you call them, they're sort of woven in amongst the gills, isn't it? Because gills ha- obviously have to be touching the water they have to be at uh, the water temperature that's right so that's where your oxygen exchange happens obviously um so you get a counter current the warm i'm gonna get this backwards aren't i hot blood crosses past the cold blood so it recovers the uh the cold blood returning from the gills recovers the warmth out of the blood going to the gills so, so basically, this is heat that the fish is generating anyway, just through a general metabolism kind of a thing. But where that would normally be just lost to the outside environment, this has a way of sort of trapping that heat and keeping it. That's right. It recovers it rather than just losing it through the gills. Because there is a um, bit of a, a debate I've noticed. A lot of the commentators are saying, oh, no, it's not really warm-blooded because it's not generating the heat specifically like that it, it's kind of capturing heat that would otherwise just be generated through the normal process of existing is that right that's right um but they're still maintaining their body temperature higher than the, the surrounding environment um and that's pretty much their entire um, body so the head the heart and the the swimming muscles are all kept quite warm so they can react quite quickly and it's a, is it a predator or is, it a, is this an escape mechanism or is this a hunting mechanism? Well, I imagine when they're little, they're, they're predated <laughs> on, but <laughs> all the stories we're talking about them being as a, a predator, so this has probably evolved as a, a method of, of outrunning their prey, mm. um, getting some advantage that way. These things can get quite big. They're talking 22 kilo to 68 kilo, with the largest being 270 kilos. <laughs> 270 kilograms for a fish. Mm. If you look at some of the, the photos of them online, they're absolutely <laughs> massive. They're literally the size of a tyre, big round yeah. things that people are really struggling to hold on to. Um, and oh. they're migrating thousands of kilometres, so that's probably something that's helping them with that as well. 
just to be able to um, get through life. And the, my favourite quote out of all the stories, not even a great white shark has a warm heart. <laughs> yeah. That's true. <laughs> mm, but this guy does. That's very cool. And yeah, and it doesn't look like a typical predator. It looks like the most ridiculous fish I've ever seen, really. Oh, don't be mean. <laughs> Come on. It looks like a big flattened beach. Come on. Ball. The most ridiculous <laughs> fish you've ever seen? Have you seen Actually, the no, hagfish? That's, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll, it's the most I'll ridiculous predator photos. fish I've ever seen. How's that? Uh, what was uh, it, Shane? Stonefish? Hmm? Frogfish? Scorpionfish? Oh, I'm going to start listing ridiculous fish if you like. <laughs> I said ridiculous predator fish. It's Sorry, favorite. I listed all predators. <laughs> 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 nice try. Very cool. Um, so this is the... How did they discover this, though? This was just something that they were dissecting it and they went, hang on, why does this wrap around this like that? Well, that's exactly right. They um, they were dissecting some fish that they were doing research on, noticed this strange um, setup within the gill structure um, and they actually recognised it as being the same structure that's used in other species, um, but normally it's in that muscle tissue, whereas this was actually in the, the gill tissue, which led them to do some more um, investigation, actually implanted temperature sensors within different parts of the fish, and they were able to tell that even as the fish dove for, for over a 1,000 feet, up to 400 metres, the body temperature remained steady, even though the water temperature is dropping sharply. Um, so it's really good evidence that they're actually <coughs> actively maintaining their their, their body temperature, um, probably just through the act activity of the pectoral fin muscles, which is their main driver, if you like. Wow. I love the idea that there's all these fish down, you know, 400 metres below the surface with all these little temperature thermometers and sensors and stuff wired in. That, that's right. So some are put in their mouth, some are put up the bum. Oh, lovely. No, I just think the whole thing is just kind of mind-blowing that you're talking 400 metres below the surface and you've got mm. all these sensors in presumably a whole bunch of different moonfish mm. which are going to be swimming around, going different depths and, as you say, they migrate quite a distance. So Yes, I wasn't exactly... I didn't actually manage to find out exactly um, how they were doing that and recovering the data, but I imagine these being such a large fish, they're literally implanting... Uh, these sensors hard drives and then okay. <laughs> so, so my, my question is um, maybe I missed it um, have they actually measured the speed this thing can go at like you know we're assuming that this warm blooded thing gives it a competitive edge in terms of swimming faster but you know how fast can it actually swim that's a good question I didn't come across that Wikipedia does say it can sustain high speeds that's as specific as it seems to yeah. get. <laughs> well, I'm guessing because it's a deep sea fish, it's very, very hard to yeah. study, obviously. It, so, yeah. it sounds like they are making an assumption that this is why they have this mechanism in place. Mm. Mm. Um, I mean, it is probably the most likely assumption. Uh, yeah, because that's, isn't, that's yeah. obviously what they're thinking with the, the uh, animals that use the regional endothermy, like your tuna and sharks. Mm. Um, that's to give you a burst of speed. Um, although some animals do use it in their eyes so they can actually heat up the eye and get a better focus um, <sighs> or even to the brain. It just doesn't also look like a... I mean, I don't know. Like, it doesn't look like a fast-swimming fish. No, it is a little bit different. <laughs> like You picture all your other fast guys like your tuna. They're, they're sleek, um, yeah. 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 This they're thing very, looks very like a flat beach ball. I mean, it, you know, you can't really imagine it swimming fast enough to catch anything. Mm. <laughs> Well, they also did mention that it's, um, these things have been migrating thousands of kilometres, so it might be uh, involved in that as well, mm -hmm. being able to keep up a faster pace. Or even just sort of um, uh, uh, stamina. Mm. You know, um, I don't know. Yeah. It's very cool. It's always good to find something unique and special. Yeah. And I wonder how it tastes. <laughs> it did say it had a rich meat. Ooh. That's as far as I found. <laughs> <laughs> that could mean all sorts of things, though. A rich meat. No, no. It could be <laughs> like you know, yeah. Could be gamey. Stuff. Could be yeah. tender. Probably tastes like chicken, though. <laughs> okay. Well, we've talked about the measles vaccine before and how important it is to vaccinate your children if it's safe to do so. But a new epidemiological study suggests it does more than just protect you from measles. The vaccine also protects you from a number of other infections for up to five years. 
Now, Shane, we, th- this is all about how measles works, really, isn't it? It sort of yeah. makes the immune system forget things. Yeah, and this is another reason why um, well, a lot of people say the measles is oh, it's just the measles. And actually, no, it's not just the measles. It's actually a fairly dangerous disease. Um, it actually, it, it does kill, even now, over 100,000 people a year per, in, in the world. And that, you know, it's, it's, when you think about it, when we, we, we've got such a, a, a comprehensive vaccination strategy. The fact that it's still killing that many people is, I think, still a bit of a worry. Mm. Um, and part of the reason that, it, well, I mean, that's the, that's the I think the initial um, fallout from the disease, but it can also apparently act in much more sinister ways up to two and a half years afterwards, and that's because apparently it um, acts on the immune system's memory cells. And I think from what I from what I've read about this, and I might be wrong, um, immunologist, so please correct me if I am wrong. <laughs> it seems to sort of carte blanche just wipe out memory cells. And memory cells are involved in your innate, in, in your, I'm sorry, adaptive immunity, whereby your body recognises infections that's already come across and says, ah, I know you, I'm going to kill you. But if, it, if this disease wipes out those cells, all of a sudden you're susceptible to all sorts of other infections that you might have already encountered and have defeated in the past. But all of a sudden you are, um, you know, you're vulnerable to them again. And that's what measles does. Now, it's so turned- potentially, then that could sorry that no. uh, that could counteract other vaccines then, because vaccines obviously yeah. teach your immune system recognise cells like this. Yes, and if you then wipe that slate clean again, mm-hmm. the initial vaccinations were pointless. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. So they've actually th- this group has done a sort of a well, they've, they've looked back on records and they've figured out that yeah, the measles vaccine does seem does really seem to confer protection against other diseases too because. They look at the, you know, the results of people who contracted measles and who didn't. And, yeah, the, the death rate and the types of deaths, there's a difference between them. So that's it, Yeah, that's something that I was not aware of, that measles was more than just the initial disease. It has this... Yeah, it's, a fairly, it's, a, it's actually a fairly dangerous disease. And people have forgotten that because it's so easily to, it's so easy to stop now. People mm. forget how actually how, how horrible it can be. It's not just you know little lumps on your face. It's actually <laughs> it can have long term effects, and this is one of them. They call it immunological amnesia. But uh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, Penny scientists have discovered a new state of matter. Now there are what five sta- Well, there's a whole lot of different states of matters if you want to get really specific. But um, we think of solid, liquid, gas, and plasma, probably being the main ones. So what are is it yarn teller metals? I don't know how to pronounce. <laughs> we'll go with I mean, that. I was I'm not the only yarn one. Teller, but, um, I'm sure one of our listeners might be out of correct. <laughs> so that's what attracted me to this story too, Ed, because to my shame, although I teach Year 7 science and we talk about the three and this wacky fourth <laughs> state of matter plus, I had no idea that there's all these other states of matter. <laughs> and... I thought, oh, my goodness, a fifth state of matter. This is crazy. And then I found out that there's actually a whole range of sort of artificial states of matter. So the ones that we know, solid, liquid, gas and plasma, are the only ones that seem to occur naturally. But there's a huge amount of other states of matter. So what is this particular state of matter and why would we even care if there's just all these weird states of matter? Like are people just making states of matter for um, just for the <laughs> sheer joy of it? Stop playing God with matter. <laughs> there's some things that man was not meant to know. <laughs> Starting with Bose-Einstein condensates, degenerate matter, super solids and super fluids. What's the matter with and you? And, of course, quark gluon oh. plasma. Thank you. Good one there, Phil. What's the matter with you? Yeah, well, anyway, oh. um, what they did for this one is they've inserted rubidium, which is an alkali metal, into buckyballs, which are those... Um, soccer ball sort of shapes. Soccer ball things made of carbon atoms. For some reason, I'm thinking there might be a Simpsons reference here somewhere, but I haven't... There's always... <laughs> There's always... <laughs> anyway. So buckyballs are already known for being superconductors. And what, by the combination, and here's where my physics is just going <laughs> to really fail it. <laughs> Somehow, because of science, <laughs> <laughs> when the rubidium is inside the buckyballs, it, they've got this structure and it can conduct 
so it can conduct electricity and heat and so on. It can insulate and magnetize while it's acting as a metal. And what is cool and why we care is because it's a superconductor at a relatively high temperature. And by high temperature, we're not talking at um, room temperature or we're talking about only minus 135 degrees. Oh, right. Okay, so but, Tasmania um, in a winter's day. But in all seriousness, no. Other superconductors tend to be sort of minus 240-ish. Yeah. So minus 135 is a big improvement and it might actually allow new technologies to be developed because what a superconductor can do is it can conduct electricity without resistance. And what that means is there's no heat energy, sound energy, or any other kind of energy getting wasted. And when I think, when you think about, for example, power generation, mm -hmm. I think like from the power plant to your home on the grid, it's terrible efficiency. I think definitely below 50%, and I think even below 30% of the energy that you get from burning the coal or whatever. Mm -hmm. So power loss from, from the power plant to the home is really inefficient. So presumably there's other applications and I'm not suggesting that we're probably not ever going to have power lines at a minus 135, but I'm sure that there's other applications where that kind of loss of power is quite critical. And part of me thinks like maybe in space somehow because it's, you know, it's cold out there. Yeah, it's well, it's much colder than minus what was 140. Mm -hmm. um, Wait, really? How cold is space? In the... Very depths of space, you're talking near yeah. absolute zero, so yeah. minus yeah. 272. Remind me why we want to go to space again. I, I don't <laughs> really understand. Anyway. But there's also, I mean, this this is the early steps. Who knows in yeah. 20, 30, 40 years, we may be able to do this yeah. uh, with these yarn teller metals at room temperature or close to. Temperature. This is just the first few stepping stones. Towards that. And what's astonishing is this thing turns from an insulator, so something that can't conduct, into a conductor by adding pressure. So that's it's, pretty cool. It's truly yeah. weird. It's it's really weird. It's like if I were that kind of scientist, I would love to be like, okay, <laughs> we've got this stuff. Let's just see what it can do. Like, what can we do with it? Oops, we tore but a then, hole in the space time continuum. Wow, well, well. <laughs> Well, it doesn't seem to be a, um, a world-destroying kind of... No, it's not. But one of the cool things that you can do with superconductors, um, go onto YouTube and do a search for quantum locking. You'll f it's one of the most extraordinary things where you have this little block of metal of some sort floating above a, a track and then you just flip it around and it will stay in whatever position you move it into while it's hovering above the track. It's very cool, and we'll have a link to it in the show notes that you should check out. Uh, so it may also have applications then for magnetic levitation of um, trains and things like that, if you can suspend large objects at very little energy. It's very cool. Uh, Shane, let's talk about the evolution of the beak and uh, some scientists who are working to reverse engineer um, the, the ancestors of birds and trace how that developed from the snout of a dinosaur to a beak. Look, this is this is one of those stories that um, I it's it's essentially sort of trying to figure out how could this have happened. Like it, we're not saying this is exactly how it happened, but we know that somewhere along the line, um, well, you know, over millions and millions of years, what is now a chicken did have a common ancestor in what was a large velociraptor. And that's really hard to believe. You look at them and go, what, really? <laughs> Come on. You know, one of them tastes good, the other one could kill me. You, you know, it still it, probably tastes good. Doesn't, maybe it did. <laughs> maybe it did. Um, I, I wouldn't be game to find out, but anyway. Um, well, part of that is obviously um, the evo evolution of the snout into the beak, like, like Ed said. And it turns out that it's actually, it's not that hard to fathom. And genetically, it's actually quite... Um, simpler than I thought. Well, I would have thought. Apparently, it's something to do with the um, the bones that form the snout in um, in dinosaurs and reptiles, which is called the premaxilla, which are the two little bones in the snout. Apparently, they can in in birds they sort of fuse together, and that's all governed by 
basically two genes or two proteins from two different genes, which are just expressed very differently in bird and reptile embryos. But if you fiddle with the genes in chicken embryos, you can basically get them to separate and you can get them to look a bit like, in, in scans anyway, because um, they, they didn't, they did this, you know, they genetically engineered these um, chicken embryos to do this, but they didn't hatch them because I, I don't think they had ethics mm. approval for it. But um, I'm supposed to get a pet one. <laughs> Sorry? How much yeah, yeah. Get a pet one? Would have been cool, but yeah, no. that's what I was promised on the Kickstarter campaign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my own pet dino chicken. <laughs> it's chicken teeth. Yes. Anyway, yeah. So they they basically they fiddled with the genetics of these of these two genes, and um and they basically got yeah like a uh, sort of proto snouts, I suppose you'd call them, to form. And this is all very early days, and it's all you know basically is a bit messy. But as they said, the evolution from snouts to beaks was very messy. Mm. And you know, of course, it would be because it's you know. Um, but and, yeah, you, it's, also, you look at the huge variety of beaks that have come from this yes. evolution. You get, you know, and also the huge variety of snouts well, that sure. would have started from it in the first place. So yeah, it's it's weird, but it's very cool. And I, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's another one of those sort of proof of concept, almost like <laughs> oh, you know, m- could this have happened? Maybe if we do this, this will sort of give us a little bit of an idea. And yeah, it's. It's probably true. This is probably what happened. Yeah, you probably had, um, d- you know, sort of evolution and weird stuff happening in these in this gene area to fact to, to influence this. Um, what exactly happened, we'll probably never know. Yeah. But it's kind of cool. Well, that it was that. also it was probably something like your convergent evolution, where snouts turned into beaks in a lot of different ways in a lot of different species, sort of thing. So it's a complicated thing yep. as always. Um, but then again, you get when you start talking about growing dino chickens like this, they only did it yeah. in embryos. It wasn't anything that was actually born yeah. and all of that. Of course. But course. you're going to get people say, well, maybe we should one day. And then we get back to the de-extinction discussion that we had a few weeks ago. But yeah. are we going to breed these dino chickens for curiosity's sake? And are we... <laughs> and so I can have a pet one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, seriously, Phil... Buy a chicken and just put a little rubber snout on it or something and, and just pretend, okay? It's the ethical I'm way. I'm <laughs> um, uh, I mean, the, 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 apparently they're going to also do something like this with tails because they want to see, obviously, fr- from tail to no tail, like as you got from, um, you know, from dinosaurs to chickens, would there would there would have been some sort of evolutionary change there too. So they they actually want to look at that and, you know, figure out what could be the genetic approach to losing a tail and becoming a tailless bird hmm. from a reptile. I think it's, yeah. I think it's interesting. I mean, it's, but it, yeah. is it just a curiosity, we wonder how things evolved? Or is there any, well, I suppose with all science, you can say, <laughs> is there any practical application to it right now? And then you get the whole what use is a newborn baby type thing. It may evolve into, well, may develop into something useful later on. But look, I mean, it could. I mean, I, I mean, that's exactly what. That's that's how, that's how these sort of discoveries are born. You mm. know, something someone goes, oh, I wonder what, what would happen, or how could this have happened, and then out of that might be born something that could be useful. If it's not, well, it doesn't matter because we've we've added to human knowledge, and that's okay. And and in terms of you know, I mean, a lot of people will say this sort of thing was cruel, but to be honest. None of them were born. They weren't hatched. They they didn't come out of the shell out of their shells with horrible deformed snouts. So <laughs> no omelets were harmed in the no story. And we managed without a single Jurassic Park reference. I'm disappointed. That's a good I, point, actually. I yeah, actually, how did we? I do was that? thinking that. I was thinking this might be some way of no segue. <laughs> I, was, I was wondering if like we're actually trying to do this without Jurassic Park. No, it's a record of some. No, no, no. We don't mention the Bruce Willis movie with the asteroids, but Jurassic Park is open slather. <laughs> All right. But before we go, Phil, what have you got planned for October this year? Anything interesting happening in Brisbane? Oh, well, just so happens we're holding the Australian Skeptics National Convention right here in Bris Vegas. Oh no. Um, we've got all sorts of fun things lined up. On Friday, we're doing a free Skepti camp. Friday night, we're doing a free variety show, um, including a live podcast recording, which we're calling the Skeptic Rabbit Hole. Um, And then, of course, Saturday and Sunday, we've got two days of the convention with lots of fantastic guests. We've got Joe Nickel, Eugenie Scott, uh, Susan Gerbic, Miles Power, 
Um, You've buried the lead a little bit here. You've got Nobel Prize winning astrophysicist Brian Schmidt. I was working out there. <laughs> lead with your best foot. Always go with the Nobel Prize winning astrophysicist. So a star-studded uh, convention and uh, it sounds like something that should be really good. And when is it and how can people get tickets? It is on October 16th to the 18th. Uh, you can get your tickets from convention.brisbaneskeptics.org. Um, yeah, tickets are $280. We're doing a few premium tickets, so you get the front row seating, etc. Uh, for $300, um, obviously tickets available for the gala dinner as well. We've got some things in the works that should be fairly exciting happening there. Um, but also on July 4th, we're doing another Skepti Wait, Camp. And a few days earlier, we have a special event with Peter Bogosian. So if you go to brisbaneskeptics.org, you'll find information on those events as well. Okay, I give you one promo spot, you take two. All right. <laughs> Brisbane Skeptic Society stuff. <laughs> no, that's good. So uh, get your tickets. Uh, the convention looks really, really good, on paper at least, and I'm sure it'll be even better in the actual reality. Uh, so get your tickets. I'll be in the audience. I'll be around. So come say hi if you see me. Uh, Phil, where can people find you on the internets? Oh, you could find me at Skeptimite on Twitter or usually hanging around on the Brisbane Skeptic Society Facebook page. And we'll have links to all of that as well. And also the stories that we talked about on the web at scienceontop.com slash 188. So check them out and please leave a comment. Uh, thank you for joining us, Phil. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Shane and Penny, as well, for joining me. Always a pleasure. Uh, did you like our show? Let us know at feedback at scienceontop.com. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. The whole theory that a Dinosaurs chicken really had... is a T-Rex. Exactly. Right, it's well, really the same. Sort of. Right. They had wishbones. Dinosaurs had wishbones. That and makes the... me uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could how, how talk about that wish. How far off this is? Like his dino chicken goal. He keeps telling me not that far away. Really? Really. He's, t he's so saying So will there be a we'll park? Does he want to open, open a park with dinosaurs <laughs> in it and some exotic island someplace and have no, horrible things happen? I guess what I wanted to know is, are you going to have to have a leash on your dino chicken? <laughs> <laughs> what size dino chicken are we talking about? Will it yeah. taste like chicken? Oh, my gosh. <laughs>